Hello, and welcome to episode 219 of the Crate and Crowbar. My name is Chris Thurston, and you're joining me on a very special Christmas evening. Very special because Tom Francis is at a Christmas party in London. Tom Sr. and Pip are at an office Christmas party in Bath. And I'm alone. No one is here except me, Chris, for the first time attempting to do an episode of the podcast by myself. Needless to say, this is a little bit of a stopgap episode before we get to next week's Game of the Year podcast. And in the meantime, I'm just going to talk for about 45 minutes with a glass of wine and hope that is sufficient that you don't feel quite as crushingly disappointed as you would have done had we cancelled this week's episode. In some ways, you may be feeling more disappointed. And believe me, I understand because I'm not at a party at all. Uh probably goes without saying and i should put this up front the patreon backers will not be charged for this because i like to think that your uh support means that we continue to produce you know stuff where people talk to each other and have jokes and and uh, enjoy each other's company and uh i'm just uh by myself in my in my office i set up the other microphones <sighs> anyway on the subject of Patreon, I did want to say a bit of housekeeping that uh, Patreon have uh, formally rolled back uh, or backed out of the very unpopular changes that they announced last week that we discussed on last week's podcast, which is great news. And thank you to everybody who either amend- got in touch or amended your donations or suggested what we could do. Were that the case? Uh, so I wanted to say that obviously it's great that those changes aren't going to go into effect and that will keep us ticking over into december however i do think there is a good case to be made for us slightly changing the way we use patreon so expect to see some changes in the new year along those lines given that we're doing so many other things when we get time for them there's uh definitely i think a case to be made for a monthly system uh where it's more about slinging us a few quid or a few dollars every month for to support the aggregate output of this nonsense channel that makes no sense uh if that's uh so thank you to everyone who suggested that because that's what put that idea in my head and uh yeah that's something we're going to look forward to in the new year as as more sort of side projects roll along and new exciting things happen uh speaking of side projects if you are disappointed that i'm just going to talk at you for about 45 minutes then there are a few other things you can listen to this week so we've got a new episode of little gray cells that'll be going up very shortly if it's not up already by the time you listen to this uh, a very fun one where we are, me and Pip are joined by, uh, my sister, Rebecca Thurston. So, uh, Becky and I also recorded a one-off, very spoiler heavy, uh, two hour sort of breakdown analysis of Star Wars The Last Jedi. So uh, everyone on the podcast is seeing it at different times and, and Becky and I talk about film a lot. So this was something that we thought would be fun to do. So that's another thing. Uh, definitely don't listen to it unless you've seen the film but that will also be available uh today as of the time this podcast goes up and this weekend there will be the final blood bomb of the year so that's coming very soon and then next week will be the final miniatures monthly of the year followed at the end of the week and in the run-up till christmas by the four parts of the crate and crowbar dungeons and dragons uh christmas special which is uh, a deeply silly uh live play dungeons and dragons story uh kind of gm'd by me starring pip and both toms so there's loads to come and i hope that's uh and also oh yeah i've also forgot well next week we'll also have our uh collective game of the year video podcast and if i have to do that one by myself then i'm going to have two glasses of wine why not uh, what have you been playing, Chris? Well, thanks, Chris. I, this week, have uh, dipped into a few things. So I'm currently playing, for review, Hello Neighbor, which was announced a little while ago, I think, and was in alpha and beta in, in various forms. It is a stealth game with a really great premise and a very compelling uh, trailer that I think works really well. Where So the notion is that you are a... Uh, a young boy who suspects something suspicious is happening in his neighbor's uh, basement. And the game is presented in a very, uh, you know, uh, almost a, a sort of Pixar-esque kind of uh, cartoon style that kind of is a veneer that sits across this quite sinister 
atmosphere of home invasion and sort of neighborly secrets. Uh, there's a little bit of the movie, the burbs in there. And the notion is that you will try and break into this house in order to access, find the key initially in the first act to find a key and get to the basement. And then other things happen from there. Uh, and as you do this, the neighbor is sort of, uh, conceived like the alien from alien isolation as a kind of intelligent, adaptive stealth opponent who, as you make attempts and has, he catches you and chases you out the house or throws you out the house, you'll kind of go back and try again and try again and try again. Uh, and he'll learn set up traps in different places and so on. Unfortunately, uh, the game is, I believe now out podcast voice. It doesn't work much if at all. So the hello neighbors issue is that, well, at a very basic level, despite multiple rounds of, um, of beta and alpha testing, uh, it's very rough around the edges. There's not a lot to, uh, there's not a lot of consistency or stability in its sort of animations and controls interactions with the environment movement is very floaty physics control of objects, which is important for the way it's stealth and puzzle solving works is very imprecise. And this means that you don't have a kind of, well, fundamentally you don't have the fine control you need in a stealth game to feel like you are, uh, you have all of your options available to you with the kind of smoothness and, uh, responsiveness that you need in order to enact your plans. The second thing about its jankiness is that it really undermines the notion that the neighbor is a genuine dynamic threat because the neighbor does weird shit constantly and you can't tell if it's responding to you or if it's broken or if or if the you know uh when it when something changes in the level whether that's because the game has forgotten what you've done or broken something in some way or if the ai is working against you so i'll give you an example you can be caught by the neighbor in which case you get grabbed and, and hoisted out of the house if that happens when you reload into the level uh, a lot of your changes will still be in effect. Any physics objects you've moved will be where you left them. Uh, boxes you've stacked to reach other areas will stay as they are. However, as far as I can tell, windows get fixed, except when they don't. And I can't tell whether this is because this is an implication that the neighbor fixes windows that have been broken after you have been caught, or if that part of the level doesn't reset resets when it shouldn't. Like, it's really... uh Incons- it feels inconsistent. Even if the logic is invisible, it doesn't matter if your interaction with it makes you feel like nothing matters because things seem kind of chaotic and strange. The AI of the neighbor, there's a nice idea in trying to, in this sort of low stake stealth thing, it's not a military scenario. You're not fighting an armed guard where someone's sort of patrolling their own house. When I say patrolling, I mean just you know, sitting, watching TV, having a bath, having a poo, going to sleep for a bit. Um, and, but unfortunately, there's no real like routine or logic to the way the neighbor moves. So you can't really plan around that. It's more about you distracting him or you just kind of doing your stuff and treating the neighbor as a kind of irritating trial and error uh, threat that, you know, sometimes he'll just walk into this room and something you can do about it and, and so on. And then, and also as a, as an opponent, he's not treated like a, a human being who responds to things as a human being might, he's kind of a creature. Uh, like if he spies you, uh, he will take the shortest route to you. If, as long as you're in his territory, um, this will often mean jumping through a window. So he will always, if he can jump through a window to reach you, uh, which you can sort of manipulate in terms of getting him to open routes for you. But those routes can then obviously be closed off if you do get caught, but it feels rough in that way that, uh, sort of, you lose confidence that it's, you know, an intelligent balanced system that is encouraging you to experiment with it. And as a, a system that will simply fall apart the moment you start poking at it, like um, when he's chasing you, he'll throw things at you. And if you look at him closely, sometimes these things appear to be coming from his face. So my strangest hello neighbor experience so far is being outside his house, but close enough to the house that he is cross at me watching him go into his bedroom, glitchily jump up onto his bed for no reason, as far as I can tell. Not really jump onto his bed, like jump next to his bed, as if he's kind of like uh sliding up the air next to the space where his bed is. Spy me through the window as he jumps, and then spit a tomato with sufficient force to hit me in the face, 25 feet away, smashing the glass in the process, before running in a straight line, bounding over the window. Um, 
running directly at me. And then I walked back about three feet past the boundaries of the household where he won't chase you. He just has stopped in front of me and looked at me for a bit and then didn't move. And I strafed away and he turned his head and looked at me and I strafed back and so on. And that's the kind of game that this is, by which I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a weird game and it, it don't work good, which is a real shame. There's also a strange, uh, sort of, you, there's a, there's a, well, so there's a puzzle solving requirement that often involves using objects in, in pretty obscure ways and holding on to specific objects, which is directly fought by both the controls and the floaty physics, but also the uh, tendency for things to fall through the floor and go missing and, and that kind of thing, which can be very frustrating. And, uh, sometimes, I don't know, like I, maybe I'm, I'm over egging it and there's the danger of uh, talking to yourself about a game is you don't know when to stop, but it's strange given that the selling point of the game is this sort of notion that you're being intelligently hunted or like that you are invading a real place. And that has atmospheric benefits. Like it is before, before the uh, facade starts to crumble, there is a real uh, palpable tension to invading somebody's home uh, I mentioned on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, an anecdote where I accidentally wandered into the wrong person's house while extremely drunk. And there's that kind of anxiety of like, Oh God, you know, this is a, a bad place to get caught. This is, and, and that fear is a really interesting thing for games to call on. And there's definitely mileage in that. There's definitely mileage in detaching stealth from fantastical military or, or sci-fi locations and putting it in the real world and, and lowering the stakes a bit and letting you feel just simply like an intruder that sort of works the first time. And that's why it's such a shame that these rules are so inconsistently implemented. For example, uh, in that first section, the upstairs area of the house is locked off for a reason. And, uh, it's only by accessing it through an upstairs window or another kind of climbing route that you can uh, basically, uh, get to the second floor because the ground floor is blocked. The staircase is blocked off by like a hidden panel that is controlled by a switch on the second floor. And that uh, is a pretty substantial change to make to the house. It means that once you've flipped that switch, that panel slides back and you can now get to the upstairs from the downstairs. Should you get caught? The AI does not appear to be intelligent enough to reset that. So presumably if we're approaching this from the point of view of like, I am trying to discover this person's secret and this person is vested in, has a vested interest in keeping that secret, then it would make sense to have the AI seek to reset the security of the house between your runs, but it doesn't, which means that once you've got in once, or it might replace the windows, but once you've got in once and open that door, it kind of stays open, even though it's visibly wide open in the center of the house in an area the AI goes past all the time. Yet despite this, the AI seemingly notices when you have opened and closed doors that shouldn't be opened or closed, so it freaks out about them, and you hear the kind of the grumbly, wordless kind of... And the, sh- the camera shake and the scary music is it, you know, discovers a change in the house and becomes more suspicious. And it's made me think a lot about how consistency in the implementation of stealth mechanics is so important for delivering on that fantasy because as soon as the bubble bursts there is a danger as with any game like this that it simply becomes a trial and error uh grind which is what it became to me because i want like i always do with stealth games to approach it on its own terms and kind of do it quote unquote right to um to have that single run where uh, you know, you kind of, uh, perfectly chain the, you know, your, your mastery of the uh, environment is expressed by your ability to, uh, you know, ghost it essentially like that kind of perfect scenario where you don't break anything. And I just don't feel like this is elegant enough. I don't feel it's consistent enough. And it's funny that alien isolation, well, I think alien isolation has more sophisticated, sophisticated AI straight up. But also the fact that it is an alien gives them the excuse to do things with it, like having it disappear into vents and come out somewhere else that help to maintain that illusion for a lot longer, to make it feel like you're gaming the system for a lot longer. Whereas I, I would challenge anyone to last an half an hour, if that, with Hello Neighbor before the kind of illusion of the neighbor's intelligence is uh, pretty badly undermined simply by the inconsistency of its implementation. It's also strangely different to the sort of trailer. It's like, uh, I believe it's, it's not, it's not, I think it's got a game from a, a very small development studio, 
uh, but uh, I think they have a publisher. I don't know how indie it is on a scale one to indie, but it's rare for me to see an indie game that has uh, screenshots that are so dramatically unlike the game in terms of the lighting and the shaders and the animation and so on. Similarly, the trailer, which is, as I still think the announcement video feels more like a kind of pre-rendered proof of concept of the game, even though it looks like first person gameplay than the game itself. And that's not to drag this into like, you know, advertising standards, uh, territory necessarily, but, uh, there is a surprising disconnect between those things so much so that it's worth, you know, it's worth watching a YouTube video just to see how different they are. Um, I think what has real, uh, potential as an interesting horror game, uh, so social horror stealth game comes off more as it feels like the kind of game that knows it will play well to YouTube. I don't mean that too cynically. I mean that, uh, it's sort of, sort of slapstick nature, the funny, the, the daft things the AI does, the sort of limited amount of meaningful freedom in game terms, but sort of slapstick freedom in terms of chucking stuff at other stuff. It offers feels like it occupies similar territory to something like Goat Simulator, uh, where, you know, the game itself is not necessarily compelling as a game, but might well work as a platform for someone else to render a let's play out of under the right most favorable circumstances which is as a compelling as argument as i can say to like watch someone else play it and then maybe don't buy it which is a shame because I, I, yeah i was i was excited to to get started with it simply because it's such a great idea um but i yes have been very unimpressed with the implementation so that's hello neighbor uh which i believe is is out now uh, I would not say that it is the, the, the Christmas game to go for. And I, I don't necessarily, I think it's, uh, I haven't finished it yet, but it's, um, it is a sort of, you know, point to point, not particularly long, uh, I think three or four act sort of single player experience. So I wouldn't necessarily hold up hope for it improving dramatically, but I could be wrong. The other thing I've been playing. Uh, which has really uh, blown me away a bit, is I finally got around to playing Hellblade, Senua's Sacrifice, which came out back in August, and I didn't play it at the time. I believe Tom Senior spoke about it at the time, about its spooky binaural audio and somewhat annoying uh, pattern-finding puzzles. Uh, so, And I've been meaning to play it because I really love Ninja Theory's work, or have done in the past, particularly uh, DMC, which I had a lot of time for. I was very interested in what they had done with this, but it's just one of those things where I'd never put aside the time or the money uh, to get it. And I finally put some hours into it now. I haven't finished it yet, but I'm still working on it. And if you didn't play it at the time and you're interested in, if you're so, if you didn't play at the time and you are okay with a game willingly giving you quite an unpleasant experience and really digging into attempting to create uh, the sense of uh, psychosis, uh, within a kind of horror setting, then I I think you definitely have to play it. Like there's a, there's a fascinating, it's a fascinating uh, approach to the kinds of games Ninja Theory has already always made. So it is still a third person game where you control a, a character with a sword who has to somehow have, sometimes have, uh, you know, sort of stylish uh, high skill cap uh, reaction based, uh, fights with a sort of with an arena full of opponents but unlike heavenly sword or devil may cry there is no kind of uh it's not a score attack game and is not interested in the kind of trappings of a game it's not interested in that pulled out camera and in the kind of fast freedom of movement it's a game that wants to sort of slow you down and make you feel make you encounter the same set of mechanics but in a context where you are always under threat and I was encouraged to doubt yourself and to kind of fear that something's going to go badly wrong. It's, it, it is actively disempowering. And then the game is actively disempowering, which means that your success at it, well, while sometimes introducing more complications in terms of each new area is more threatening than the last, your success feels like the thing you get is not a man bellowing savage because you've done an amazing combo. It's 
a momentary feeling like you're not totally shit at this and you're not doomed, uh, which is reflected in brilliant ways in the game's presentation. And that in itself is a small aspect of what Hellblade does, but it's such an interesting uh, sort of, and I think quite mature reappraisal of how action games can be used to tell stories with uh, a bit of real kind of human meaning to them because it is violent it's heavily implied that the, a lot of the violence is taking place in in Senua's head you know the, the 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 attackers that come at her are these towering sort of semi-corporeal uh sort of uh masked viking warriors uh always bigger than her always more threatening always sort of wordlessly kind of uh or maybe they speak in norse but actually, walking at her and um kind of and then when they're not directly attacking sort of almost surrounding and enclosing her and so it's a, a combat is not a express your dominance kind of experience nor is it simply uh a bit of you know just sort of uh, a bit of friction to prevent you from sliding effortlessly through the game it's about creating an atmosphere of um oppressive threat that only through keeping trying to stay calm and focused which so this is this is the great thing about it being a combat system uh, in addition to the puzzles and stuff in the game is that the combat system is built around uh, reactions and understanding like any other game like this like understanding oh this is an attack i need to block and if i block it at exactly the right moment i'll open up a vulnerability this is an attack i need to dodge this is an attack that uh i i need to res- this is a defensive position that i need to respond to with a guard breaking kick these kinds of systems these are very familiar if you played any game like this dmc bayonetta and so on in the traditional context, this is about orchestrating a kind of mad dance as Dante or Bayonetta, whoever, you know, pirouettes around the battlefield, landing the perfect, having the perfect response to everything. Hellblade is the same system in a completely different context where the game is about Senua's psychosis, the fact that she is struggling to hold her mind together in the face of not just uh present tense grief for the her center on this mission this sort of quest to helheim to viking hell holding the the head of uh presumably a dead loved one at the start of the game but uh to reclaim the soul of a loved one but this comes after a lifetime spent dealing with what the game refers to as her darkness which is I think explicitly, I don't think it's, it's too much to read into this to say it's essentially, you know, this is, this is a story of a, an extreme event, obviously, but fundamentally she's someone who has always lived with, uh, I guess I'm, just put it directly with mental illness and that, you know, it's said in, you know, she is a Celt, I think walking into uh norse mythology an outsider in that regard but also someone from a culture that would not understand uh what she is suffering from therefore it's presented as this sort of externalized sort of uh quasi divine force that that is is driving her and attacking her and, and and all of these things but the mechanics by which she overcomes it in the small, and it's not something you overcome totally. It's not, well, that's the point. It's, it's, it's something that, uh, she survives or not based on your actions as a player. And her survival is based on your ability as a player to remain as kind of, uh, focused and responsive to the inputs you're being given as you can. And that is the benefit of having a game like this, which could have also worked in terms of the story it wants to tell as uh, a game without that kind of challenge, uh, a, a Dear Esther, because there are lots of things about its presentation that feel like Dear Esther to me. Whereas with that challenge element, you, the player, are kind of brought into the the difficulty of remaining on on course and there are uh, that binaural audio that tom spoke about last time is used to surround you with voices that are always telling you uh that you're going the wrong way sometimes that you're going the right way and they reflect senua's uh doubts and anxieties and fears but also her like momentary surge of surges of self-belief and 
And then when you're in combat, some of those voices remain, depending on how it's going, some of those voices will shift into a kind of like, she's not going to make it kind of mode. And sometimes they'll be more positive. And sometimes there'll be like one voice among the mix that is more like her instinct for fighting, which will tell her that an attack is about to come in from behind. And there's no other indication for this. Uh, the camera is so closed in that an attack from behind is a real threat. And the way you process this as a player is you learn to try and pass that all this auditory data that the game is giving you to hear for that one useful thought that says look behind you and there's a it's very effective at uh when you start to fail at combat it's often because you've become distracted and that reflects the condition that senua lives in and that means that she, and that is reflected in the audio and in the the background audio and the writing and so on. When you do well in combat, it sort of evolves around that to reflect the fact that she is feeling more cogent and that she is, uh, that the thoughts are kind of coming together because she goes through periods of lucidity and psychosis as the game progresses anyway. And it's just, that's just the combat system, but it's so kind of effective. Like I found it tremendously evocative and, um, difficult like hard going but like just incredibly impressive as a way of rethinking what those games what those kinds of systems can be used for like not simply like and that making a more mature game out of the kind of traditional verb set of games isn't just about throwing things out that there is uh, it's not simply about making games without challenge but that even though that has benefits it's about um figuring out how to Embo- really embody an emotional state in a combat state. Cause I, I mean, I would, I would say that Ninja Theory have been traditionally good at this. I think the, I think that, um, DMC is good at embodying Dante's, you know, cocky, uh, bravado in the way you fight and approach enemies. It's far more video gamey than, than that. And also that is a very video gamey emotion. Um, I'm great at killing with my guns and my cool sword is not, is a very, uh, that's a, that's an emotional state that games are very comfortable with and that maps onto what games want to do very neatly. Whereas, you know, the kinds of anxiety and psychosis that send your experiences are not. And yet those same systems can be used to put you in that situation, even if it is in this, you know, sort of, uh, fantastical context of a, of a kind of Viking, uh, semi real hell scape. There's, uh, loads of really good acting in it. Um, I really enjoy, uh, the way I think superimposed live action is used, uh, brilliant visual effects and, uh, changing not just one, but many ways of representing her, uh, flawed, uh, sorry, well, not flawed, uh, her heightened sense of her environment. And, uh, sort of, uh, yes, like a kind of, um, uh, her hallucinatory kind of auditory and, and visual hallucinations that change how she sees things. And those are, I think, so I do agree with Tom that the, a lot of the pattern finding puzzles where you, you approach a door. And one thing I love is that you approach these doors and they have a rune on them and, and Hesenia needs to find the rune in the environment before she can progress. But at no point does she establish that the door isn't already unlocked. It's simply that finding the rune is, necess- is necessary for her. So, uh, and I think this is another elegant way in which the themes of the game are kind of tied into the play. Like you, the player might be frustrated because you're aware that actually there really probably isn't anything stop quote unquote stopping you from progressing. But what's important, but actually it's anyone's perception of the world in that moment is more important. So you have to do this thing in order to map successfully onto this information that she's heard about how her march into Helheim is going to work. And that, uh, sometimes I think it's simply the mechanics of finding those places is a bit sort of fiddly and in certain parts to it speak to the idea that it's, uh, you know, it was almost certainly extensively play tested. And I suspect some of those play testers struggled to find the right places to, uh, to, you know, look to find the rune to open the gate and so on. More effective is, uh, there are multiple zones as you go off to different, uh, functionally different kind of, uh, some figures from myth whose blood you need to spill in order to open the gates to Helheim. 
in the very first part of the game. And each of these areas is themed differently uh, around sort of illusions and fire. And each of them has different ways of building puzzles to do with relatively simple puzzles, but puzzles to do with perception uh, of your environment and kind of shifting understanding of your environment around the themes of the mythological figures that uh, occupy it. And tied to all of this is some pretty strong writing, both in terms of North mythology and, and tying a uh, sort of, uh, sort of dark age realism, I guess, uh, not, not realistic necessarily, but I know that like, you know, historical hist- historians were consulted for the making of the game. So it feels sort of, um, rooted in like a kind of magically real approximation of the reality of life for people at a certain point in history. Uh, that's a really rough way of putting it, but I've got no one to bounce this off. So bear with me. Um, it's very intelligently done essentially in a way that I'm, uh, just really, really getting a kick out of. It's interesting. I think when the game was released, it drew a uh, flack. I think we talked about this in the podcast already for, uh, very early in the game. It threat the, uh, Senua, Senua's hand, it gets sort of consumed by darkness. It looks burned, but I think it's, you know, it is the darkness itself. And as you fail, as you're defeated in combat, the darkness spreads up her arm. And as you are told at the beginning of the game, uh, that if it reaches her head, she will die. Appreciate we discussed some of this before on the podcast, but I will say mechanical spoilers for the next two minutes. And I'm going to look at the timer. That caused such for at the time that developers had to withdraw the, uh, had to withdraw the, no, they didn't have to withdraw the system. What I'm talking about, they had to explain that the system was a feint, that, uh, it simply doesn't work that way. And that there's actually, it's simply there to just make you feel something. It's simply there to make you feel under threat. However, I would say actually that, um, something that I don't think we discussed at the time is that Hellblade actually seems to have quite a few hidden mechanics in it. Stuff that I don't necessarily want to talk about because I do want people to play it. And I, I very much benefited from discovering things, uh, because it is a game without a UI. It relies on all of those surrounding voices in the environment, uh, to tell you what state Senua is in. And the great thing about this is that everything about the game establishes that those voices and the environment itself, all of it is unreliable. All of it is you're, you're, you're sort of, you're in a sea of unreliable narrators. And that means that sometimes what you're being told is not the truth. And sometimes your will as a player, your desire for what should happen can actually be enforced on the game. And that's a, wonderful little design trick. Some of it's pretty simple stuff, but I, yeah, I'm not going to spoil it. I think even, even with the amount of months that's passed, there's a, there's an elegance to it because it doesn't have to tell you there are hidden mechanics in this game for, for them to make the moment where you discover them unique. And that feels like the inversion of the, the, the bit where the text pops up to literally tell you that if you, if you play badly, then the rot will reach your head and you will die. I think Hellblade's strength comes from how little it has to tell you uh, in a kind of out of character way uh, for you to uh, kind of l- have a meaningful experience of learning it. And that's a, that's laudable. That That's a hundred percent great. Um, actually, weirdly, probably its weakest idea is the one that it drew the most flack for because it's the one that it has to, simply write out for you in, in big letters. So, uh, so the good thing about this is that if you did have one or two of Hellblade's kind of mechanics spoiled for you, either by us in a previous podcast or right now, or through another means based on the coverage of the game at the time, uh, despite, well, I would say this by me being, having those things spoiled for me, uh, I have been continually surprised by it. So for that reason, like, it really does get a big recommendation for me. Like uh, I'm planning on keeping playing it very soon. I'd like to finish it before next week because uh, next week we'll be talking about our games of the year. And I'd be very surprised if I didn't talk about it a bit. Like I really think it's, I think they've done a a really tremendous job of uh, building a really unique action game uh, in a time where that's not, that's not the direction that anyone seems to be going that I can think of. There's a movement away from traditional 
game mechanics, certainly, but a, a movement to uh, reclaim and recontextualize and find more sophisticated ways to use existing game mechanics is just, it's great to see. Like, not to say it's, it's perfect, like, Tom is right when there is a, certainly a clunkiness to some of those puzzles. And um there's a, you know, it works. It flows brilliantly if you sort of get the puzzle or don't, you know, if your interaction with the puzzle has just enough friction to feel like you are struggling because that's the game's kind of primary emotional palette. But the moment you start kind of like backtracking and wandering and trying to make sure you're standing on the right point, it does cease to be about Senua's kind of... um experience and becomes about your experience of trying to stand in the right place which yeah yeah that's not perfect but man like even um even the boss fights are good i know i appreciate i kind of like boss fights but like even the uh the combat is good enough mechanically to be quote unquote enjoyable purely in game terms but the fact that your engagement with it pushes you into hopefully experiencing the real themes of the game and why they're important and to appreciate combat partly as something that seems to center senua even as she is struggling against sort of assailants that it is very likely um are not corporeal yeah it's um there's it's just such a cool thing and it's such a great series of um design leaps and imaginative leaps to get to there from dmc so yeah ninja theory they they've done a good game and i like it and no one is here in my room so it falls to me to ask me if i would like to do some questions from questions now I'm not going to do a lot of questions because you'd be surprised to learn that, well, questions often work best when there are multiple of us to offer, uh, different, you know, perspectives on, on stuff and also to make jokes. I am sorry that this has been quite a low jokes podcast. It's because, uh, strangely enough, when there aren't other people in the room, I find it harder to laugh at my own jokes. Weird. Anyway, it might be time to do some questions. I did want to read out one question because it is timely and uh, time specific from Kane, a uh, community wizard and living Wikipedia of our podcast. Kane writes, hello. In the Discord community this holiday season, we're holding a game of the year vote. It's open to any member of the server and will run from this Friday until probably the 5th of January so that folks have a chance to vote for the games they got for Christmas. The winners will be depicted on a webpage alongside a medal with the picture of a smug goat on it, which I personally think is the greatest reward anyone could hope for. Anybody who's interested can vote at Kane... Oh, hang on. I'll read out the URL, but I'll also post it in the show notes. It's kane-t.github.io forward slash goatee hyphen 2017, which will be linked to in a pinned message in the Discord server, and I would add in the show notes to this episode. You can also come back to the page and edit your vote as often as you like while the polls are open. To make sure this email is not entirely shilling, how about a question? I'm sure we'll be learning about your inspired choices for Goatee 2017 in an upcoming episode, but in the meantime, can you tell us what your Goatee of the Year is? As a follow-up, what was your favourite goat of 2017? Also, your favourite gloat. Thanks for asking three questions to a man sat alone in his bedroom, Kane. Uh, my favourite Goatee of the Year was uh rediscovering your uh facebook uh 10 years ago this was you oh god uh feature that uh thank god that exists and that was a, a fine way to discover my brief dalliance with having a goatee in the year 2007 um certainly the most uh it was good in the sense that it was bad and that i benefited tremendously from the fact that a full uh, human decade has taken place since that dark time. Uh, my favorite goat of the year. Uh, this is, uh, this is tricky, uh, because I haven't had, when did I meet a goat? I know that you're listening, you're still listening to this, aren't you? Uh, when did I meet a goat? I met, hmm, I think it was unfortunately last year that I met a very good goat in Kent. However, uh, this year, 
I've not been lucky enough to actually meet a goat in person. I did enjoy the uh, eclipse, the live stream of some fainting goats during an eclipse that was uh, entertaining primarily because this was during the eclipse in the United States. The notion was that the goats would faint upon it becoming uh, dark because of the, the moon is how I understand that it works. However, um, unfortunately, when it is dark, cameras also struggle to pick up action that is dependent on light reflecting off objects and into the lens of the camera. That's how that works. And as a consequence, they had not thought this entirely through. So it became extremely dark and presumably something happened to the, the goats, but you couldn't tell. And then it became light again because the sun was, was actually out from behind the moon because that's how that works. And, uh, and, and, and no apparent change had occurred in the goats that they were my goats of the year um primarily because of the small role they played in this unfolding uh content half arsing event i was going to say a catastrophe but that would over egg how dramatic it was it wasn't it wasn't sufficiently dramatic to get a fainting goat to faint and you know those guys will faint at anything so that's not that wasn't you know it could that could have been that could have been better let's see also uh there's some really good goats in uh episode six of season one of poirot which we do cover in this week's little gray cells a little plug there for you and that brings me on to uh, my favorite gloat of 2017 which unfortunately um i don't think i have an answer to uh because i am um, as a man who is sat alone with a glass of wine talking into a microphone uh to a stranger probably commuting in in their car or train yeah you i'm talking to you uh, right now i don't really feel like uh like there's a it's the it's the place to to gloat about my uh position really uh yeah sorry that's super depressing i didn't mean that i'll tell you what uh my gloat is that we've got such brilliant uh podcast community and i'm genuinely grateful for it and that's been something that has occurred to me multiple times this year is how lucky we are that our uh, dumb thing that we do in my office every week has somehow spurred uh, such a wonderful and uh, diverse and intelligent uh, more intelligent than us and also soberer and um, also present in a community collective speaking to each other not alone in a bedroom way that um, i uh, value both now specifically but also broadly uh, to turn this into a goat gloat I turn it into a goat turn it into a gloat i'll just say um no, 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 no suck it cool ghosts there you go i gloated i didn't mean it that was an email from kane uh, and it's done now thank god what am i talking about i don't know let's answer one more question james right steer create a crow war no create a cow war that's pretty good actually merry christmas when you die which video game would you like to tell your life story for me, it would have to be a dwarf fortress with procedurally generated versions of myself splitting off into a multiverse of possibilities of what could have been. Though the version of me dying of starvation naked and insane because I could not make the bucket out of shells may hit a bit close to the bone. Love you, James. I've just realized that this solo episode of the podcast has gone to a pretty dark place because I'm by myself. So I think this, um, I feel like the temptation here is obviously to keep going as like dystopian notions of your own existence, like Dwarf Fortress or uh, everyone's gone to the rapture or Thomas was alone or, um, or dear Esther or um, I don't know any other game where if your friends have all gone to parties, uh, I don't mm, then. Uh, but actually I think if I was to have my life story told by a video game, I would just like it to be Katamari Damacy. That's what I would aspire to. I want to be a very small man. Luckily, I'm already there who just starts pushing some stuff and then the stuff keeps getting bigger and just keep rolling and just keep rolling and just keep rolling and listening to that wonderful soundtrack until you're the size of the cosmos itself. Um, that would be perfect. That or, or everyone's gone to the rapture, depending on, you know, how my day is, is, is going. Uh, which is all right, actually. Uh, how are you? Anyway, this is going to bring to an end uh, this first and hopefully last uh, uh, Chris Thurston 50-minute fugue state experience. I hope you, you discovered a new game to both buy and not buy. If you were unsure, uh, the answers are going to be now at the end of the episode. The answers to that quiz are probably buy Hellblade, probably don't buy the other one, uh, Hello Neighbor. I didn't like it a lot, and I spent 20 minutes explaining why, I think. Uh, 
If you'd like to send us a question for a podcast, bear in mind that the next episode and the final episode we record this year will be our Game of the Year special, where we're not going to do questions. So it might be worth sort of getting them in for the new year. Also, I'm going to keep a backlog of questions that uh, I didn't feel were appropriate uh, for me to answer. But Chris, you did such a great job of answering those questions. You just answered, why didn't you think that the rest of them would be appropriate? That's a great question, me. However... It could have been even worse is what I would add. However, if you do want to send us those questions, the email address is questions at crate and crowbar dot com. If you'd like to follow us on Twitter, you can do so at crate and crowbar. We're on YouTube forward slash crate and crowbar. Patreon, you better believe it. That's patreon.com forward slash crate and crowbar. Wherever I say slash, I do mean forward slash because that's how that works. We're not in your hard drive, right? Anyway, uh, your Patreon donations are very much uh, appreciated and do support the range of stuff that we're doing. Hopefully, as I, as I said at the beginning of, of this episode, we're about to put out a tidal wave of content uh, to tide you over with Christmas. With Christmas? For Christmas. I'm very sorry. I'm, this, I've had a long... I, I, anyway, if you would like to follow us as individuals, I... I'm on Twitter at C Thurston. I don't use it very much anymore, but I am on it and I will post links to stuff that I'm working on. So, you know, all best for that and so on. That's it. Uh, I, uh, thanks for listening, everybody.